Welcome to our continuing series of virtual voices, focusing on the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. It is a pleasure today to introduce an old friend, Dr. Alexander Swister, who graduated from Harvard University and Brown University Medical School. Then he joined the surgical staff at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital and became the chief of breast surgery. He was instrumental in developing the Whale Cornell Breast Center and became the director of the program. Dr. Swisto is acknowledged internationally as an expert in the field and has pioneered many improvements in the delivery of breast cancer over the many years. Over to you, Dr. Swisto. Thank you, Dr. Gerbach. I appreciate the introduction. I thought about what to speak about that would be interesting and timely. And sometimes it's important to know where you've been so that you can understand where you are now. And by that, I mean that if you look to the past, you can see the developments of the future. And what I thought would be very helpful here is to kind of go through a historical background of the evolution of breast cancer surgery from many years ago to the present day and to show you that we've made such great progress in both the diagnosis and the treatment of this disease. And the nice thing about the surgical issues is that it started with surgery, but it's starting to actually change its course. And surgery is not as bad as it used to be. And I wanted to show those kind of uh, actionable items that have changed in terms of my approach to disease as I've seen it change over my course of time, but also to look into the future where I think there won't be any surgery for this disease. And that I think that we're looking forward to an era where we will not need to have an operation, but we'll probably have some medicine to actually mitigate the disease, cure the disease. And, you know, I do feel that at some point it will become like an antibiotic for a bacterial infection and that we will be having the recipe for a particular tumor and they'll be able to help us. But in the meantime, as I said, I thought it would be an interesting idea to just go over and just take a look and see what the historical background has, has been like. And uh, so I'm calling this little talk, the evolution of the surgical care of uh, breast cancer. So in, interestingly enough, of course, uh, October has been traditionally the uh, month for uh, October Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And it's in the news, this is an old cover from Time Magazine, the new thinking on breast cancer, you could say the same as it was today as it was years ago. There's always new things that are going on. And I'm going to basically delve into the surgical issue. I always show this kind of a slide because I think it's important for people to realize in the United States, uh, there's, uh, and I'm gonna ask you to look at the right side the diagram. So in terms of the cancer deaths, you can see that the number one cause of death in the United States is lung cancer for the female population. And breast cancer comes right behind it at the second point. Then there's a various other types of tumors. I think also what's important to understand is that the new cases of breast cancer, it is overwhelming. 31% of all new cancer cases in the female population is breast and then lung is down. And interestingly, you know, the lung is going down because I think as people are less and less inclined to smoking, I think the issues about lung cancer associated with smoking is also decreasing. But look at breast, it's 31, it's almost a third of all the cases. And if you look around what I would call the hot spots around the world, where you see the areas in red represent the areas where mostly is identified breast cancer. Now there are some areas, interesting, of course, you can see the North American continent is pretty much all red. There are areas in Europe, of course, that are 
very much uh, high rates of breast cancer. And there's also in South America, you'll see Argentina and Uruguay. But other places where you see the darker blues and the grays doesn't necessarily mean there are not a lot of breast cancer there. What that means is that the reporting of breast cancer is not very good. If you look at the whole map of Russia, Ukraine, those that area in Asia, you get the feeling that there is really very little breast cancer. In fact, that's not true, but their reporting of breast cancer is not as good as, as some of the other countries. So uh, I also wanted to show you this trend in incidence rate. Now, this is, I've given this talk over the years, and as I've been doing this, it's been interesting to me to see that of all the other cancers, the incidence rate among women has been pretty flat line, right? So, so cancer rates in breast has been pretty steady over the last few years in, in this particular instance, but uh, the death rate is, and this is it, I'm going to show you, this is a, and I want to accent to the green line. The green line is the breast cancer. And so even though we were thinking we were getting all kinds of newer ways of taking care of this disease, we clearly were not impacting on the death rate. Other tumors, death rate was going down, but not breast. See the flat line? Although all of a sudden the death rate started decreasing, about, you know, sometimes in the 80s and the 90s. We were wanting to see if this would, now again, this is a graph I gave about almost 20 years ago, I showed this, these numbers. And now if you look at the latest ones, focus on the breast, look what's happening. So we are actually impacting on the death rate of breast cancer. People are living longer. And you can actually look at this, this curve started going down. And what's fascinating is that what happened here at about this time? Well, what happened is mammography started coming useful. And what mammography has done is continued to improve. And so we're starting to see earlier, early stage breast cancers. And this is a good thing. So even though the incidence rate is the same, the death rate is. And that's great news because that curve is continuing to drop because people are living longer because of better therapies. And that includes also the addition of things like medicines for uh, preventing breast cancer and, and treating it in more of a targeted therapy. So, so let's go back in time. 3000 BC. Now, it's interesting that the papyruses in 3000 BC from the Egyptians said there was no treatment for this disease. <laughs> it says trauma and disease ailment in which I will contend. But then Hippocrates came over and said, it's better not to treat anyone because if you treat that patient, they die quickly. Probably because by the time they got to the treating doctor, if you will, uh, it was so advanced that there wasn't much help at all. The first initial description of breast cancer therapy is from 1600 BC. And I, I had this uh, for many years and I never knew exactly what I was looking at. These are Egyptian hieroglyphics. And what was fascinating is that I finally had a patient who came in who was an Egyptologist from the Metropolitan Museum. And I said, wait a minute, Wayne, before you go, he says, I wanna show you a picture because can you translate this for me? So in this picture is this is a pictures of breast cancer being treated. Now I'm just going to point out that apparently this is the breast, and you see the breast appears in different places. And here it's a half cut off, and then these are knives that are used to take the breast off in terms of the treatment. So that's how this works out. And then meanwhile they have pictures of this. And this is an early Egyptian depiction here of, of a breast that's been removed. So this woman has her breast. There it is, and in this picture it's gone. This has been removed. And there's another picture showing the same thing. Here's one breast and this has been amputated. So there definitely was breast removal and mastectomy starting over 2000 years ago and the Egyptians were doing this, but they didn't know what they were really doing when they were advocating this kind of procedure. So breast cancer has been around a long time. I think it's interesting that, that of all the tumors that you can think about, the reason breast cancer was talked about from the very beginning is because if you consider, let's say colon cancer, stomach cancer, even lung cancer, other type of malignancies, they're hidden, right? They're, they're under your skin or they're inside your body. The breast is external. And so anything that happens to the breast is gonna be easily visible. And so back in 200 AD, Galen was a well-known person at the time said, 
make sure you take everything out, don't leave a single root. And he was the one that first started this idea about cancer as a crab. And that was because the way the cancer took over the breast tissue, it looked as if there was this central area and there were these extensions along the skin. And those were actually the cancer that was growing through the skin in the crab leg. So that's the origin of why cancer the crab and the constellation of the crab is, is called cancer. He also spoke of the humors and his idea was that the black bile that was in their body was going to the breast and that's what the problem was. I also thought it'd be fun to see a little bit about how breast cancer has been seen through the eyes of artists throughout the ages. So if we go back to every, anybody who's been to Florence, there's a very famous uh, chapel there, the Medici Chapel, and there's an altar piece there, and I'm pointing it out over here, and it, the picture is of Adam and Eve, okay? Now, what's fascinating about this picture here, here is Eve, and if you look carefully, Michelangelo has made a perfect, perfect body type, as he was, of course was, and you can see a perfectly normal breast on the right side, but close inspection of the left side tells me that these are the hallmarks of someone who has been treated or is developing breast cancer. There's nipple inversion, there's indentation. This wasn't just a miss on his part of the sculpting. This was on purpose. And it really tells us that people were aware of this happening even back then. And if I get the close up of it, yes, you can see that there's the indentation, there's a, a defect, there's a flattening, all signs of early stage breast cancer. Rembrandt also had a very famous picture in his day uh, he had a very, uh, very important model that he used in a lot of his work. And there's this very famous picture of, uh, of Bathsheba at her bath or something. And, it, and, it's, uh, and basically she's, she's exposed here and in the bath. But again, I want to point out something that's happening. So here's a, the right breast is normal. But if you look carefully, there is discoloration. This doesn't show very much, I'm sure, on PowerPoint. But if you see the picture, there are some ideas about breast cancer. It also causes some redness, indentation, again, shadowing that you're seeing. And interestingly enough, here it is, again, the shadowing, the, a little bit of pinkish, suggestive of a cancer involving the skin. Now, this same model was used in a subsequent picture. And here she is about five to 10 years later. This is the same person you've seen before, again, painted by Rembrandt. But now look how she's hiding that breast that was diseased. And now she's developed all the signs of probably failure, congestive failure of the heart from, from the exposure of the abdomen is distended. This is probably means that the disease has gone into her abdomen and other plants. She's hunched over because it also affects the bones. And so Rembrandt depicted a really good idea about here was someone who was not treated for breast cancer. It was the same model just a few years later, and that's what breast cancer, and she subsequently passed away. Well, we were talking about uh, early years of treatment, and we call the dark ages of treatment before the Renaissance. Right? And at that time, the Catholic Church decided that this was barbaric surgery. The mastectomy should not be done at all, and it would be condemned by any of the surgeons who were doing this. Now, why did they condemn them? Well, here's a picture of what they did back then in the pre-Renaissance days for treatment of breast cancer. All right, so now you can see this very sad, unhappy looking woman who is being held up here. And of course, they're cutting off her breast for the breast cancer, uh, not a happy situation. Note over to the left side, they have some iron pokers here that are heating up so that when the breast is removed and of course there'll be bleeding, they would stick the pokers onto the chest wall and this would make the bleeding stop. You can imagine how awful this was and you can see why people were saying, there's gotta be a better way to do this. So after the Renaissance, there was a lot more interest in terms of the evolution of surgery. Uh, 1628, William Harvey first figured out how the blood flow system, it works in the circulatory system. Uh, Bartholin described the lymphatic system, which is very important here because cancer cells travel through lymphatics. And he thought about this as a waste system of travel throughout the body. But then there's this fellow named Scultitis. He was an early surgeon in the 1600s. And what he said, he was, he saw those methods of doing uh, mastectomies. And he says, well, I have a better way of doing this. 
See, the idea was that if you could do this quickly on someone and remove that breast, it would be less painful. So he came up with this idea. He, this, was, this was his picture. So basically, he would poke the breast with this kind of uh, uh, think think of like you're you're having a flattened irons going through the bottom of the breast, and they're tied to this rope. And so this would then lift the breast up off the chest, and they would immediately cut the breast off, and then they would stop the bleeding with that iron poker. This thing could do probably in the space of like 35, 30 seconds to a minute. And this was the modern method. And notice the breast here is up here, right? So they cut this off, the breast is pulled up to the ceiling, and uh, then this area of bleeding is taken care of. All right, people uh, started thinking about better ways to doing things. Queen Anne of Austria in the 1600s was a benefit of this famous method. And here you can see a picture, an actual picture of how they depicted her on the table there. Uh, notice all the people holding her down to, to be able to do this. And uh, even here in the state, United States, just uh, down the street from my office is the Abigail Adams house. And in the 1700s, she was uh, a John Adams uh, wife and was diagnosed and treated for breast cancer, again, with some of the newer techniques. Well, things got a little bit better. By the 1700s, there were people in, in Europe and, and here in the States were deciding that the key here was to remove the breast tissue, remove those muscles, and remove the lymph nodes. So, okay, fine. So this is what would happen. They, they would do this, and you know, this looks like a really nice picture of the technique here, but you can see all the hands, no, no gloves, right? This is all bare hands work, cutting off that breast and putting her back together in the 1700s. Well, no one really liked this approach, and a lot of women, understandably, would not want to go through something like this. And so what happened would be a situation where people started saying, so maybe we shouldn't operate on breast cancer. It's not such a happy surgical procedure. Anesthesia had still not come to the fore. And remember, anesthesia only started being developed in the late 1800s. So back then, there was a study that was done in London, and this was published sometime in the 1890s, or more a hundred years ago. And what they did is they decided, you may know that people who have tuberculosis, they have the so-called sanitariums where they would go to have better breathing, air supply was better for the tuberculosis because there wasn't much treatment. So they would set up these places where people went, well, guess what? So they did the same thing with breast cancer patients. They decided that they would build these kind of hotels for women who had breast cancer, and they would just keep them there and try to take care of them as time went on. So what's interesting here is that this is the only way that we can uh, uh, kind of think about uh, what would happen in a real data form and a study form of what happens to a woman who has breast cancer diagnosed and how long does she stay alive? What's fascinating is that not everyone dies right away. I mean, this is a 10 year curve and look at this, even with no treatment whatsoever, they were, they were doing pretty well for about 10 years. And remember lifespan back around the turn of the previous century was not that long anyway. So this was an argument based on this study from London that maybe we shouldn't do any surgery at all for breast cancer because we're not helping them at all. And look, a lot of people will still be alive. I mean, even at five years, it'd be oh, about 20% were alive uh, in this case. So into this time frame comes a fellow named William Halstead. He was a student uh, at Columbia College, physician and surgeon medical school, graduated from there. And he decided that he wanted to improve surgery and he was a real pioneer in many surgical techniques. He was actually working here in New York City in the 1890s. And he decided that the reason there was so much negative aspects about breast cancer surgery was, and it was true because people were still not doing well after the radical surgery was done and why bother with the radical surgery when they would live anyway without it. But he was 
absolutely certain that the reason was that the surgeons just weren't good enough. So he embarked on this idea that if he could get all the diseased tissue removed and to put the patient back together again, and remember anesthesia was starting to come up now. So now we had general anesthesia that was able to tolerate the, the procedures better, right, for the patient. So his idea here was, and here, this is a picture. This is a picture from the first paper from 1894 when he reported on his cases. And so the idea was to remove the entire breast, remove the muscle off the rib cage, remove all the lymph nodes and the overlying skin. And by that, he felt that he would cure breast cancer because he would remove all the tissue that was bad. And that seemed like a good idea. No one else was doing this. And so he wrote this up and overnight after this paper was written, everything changed. And then he showed a graph. Now I'm gonna take you back to that previous graph. Remember I told you the untreated cases. So he was a really smart guy and he was able to show that with his radical mastectomy procedure, look at what happened. The survival was better and longer. And so clearly he was impacting on the survival of these women as opposed to that study in London that I just showed you before, where the 10-year results are 5%, look at the difference here. So this got everyone excited. And from 1894 onward, this became the standard of care for breast cancer. And so this was his picture. This is what it looked like after the breast was removed. And then they would put a skin graft along the way to, to close the defect. And the woman would go and it would look like this. This is what the mastectomy looked like. And I will tell you that this continued to be the way. And, and by the way, if you look at this very carefully, you'll see the rib cage. That's because the muscle has been removed here. The incision starts from underneath the arm. This smart woman has her arms up and it goes all the way across the chest here. And people did very well with this operation. On the other hand, you know, what you might say is, well, okay, great. You've got the sur surgery, but look what you've done to me in terms of how I will feel about myself, you know, but people were focused on, on curing. Uh, and this was the radical mastectomy as it looked like even to when I started the training. All right. They started to improve it somehow. So there's a fellow named Patey who said, well, why do we take the muscle away? Maybe we could save the muscle. So it would make the chest wall look a little better. And also let's make the incision lower. So he made this incision across rather than up and down. And in terms of the way the women looked afterwards, it was better. So I'm showing you someone who had the first radical mastectomy, which was the Halstead type. Again, you can see the rib cage here. And I'm sorry for the graphic pictures, but you know, I there's no easy way to show this. But this woman was cured on the right side, but on the other hand, developed cancer in the opposite breast. So this breast, you can see the difference in the chest wall, right? The muscle's still there, the skin is smoother. And the other thing is one of the complications of the Halstead surgery was the edema and the and large amount of fluid in her right arm, which made it very difficult to, to use the arm and people had trouble with that. This was the improvement. Here, the arm was much better and much more useful. All right, so that's what we're dealing with. We've now improved the radical mastectomy, we're keeping the muscle, we're keeping the skin. And once that happened, uh, back in the, here's a curve that showed the difference, right? So with the, it was called a modified radical. That was the Pady modified radical. And you can see that the percentage of patients now who are getting this improved mastectomy started rising up into the 80s. And gradually everyone stopped using the Halstead mastectomy. So by 1981, pretty much, very few people were doing that radical surgery and uh, the modified radical became the standard of care. So now here was how it was like back then in those days. Uh, there was the, it, that's why they call the operating rooms a theater. It was a theater because people would be able to see up in the stands to watch the, the mastectomy being performed. And that's how people were trained and, and they could see it real time. So there were people, however, who said, well, maybe maybe there, there's a better way of doing this because even with the mastectomy, people were still dying of breast cancer, still developing disease. Sometimes the disease came back. So a, a very famous surgeon named Dr. Jerome Urban, who was at Memorial Sloan Kettering, uh, was able to develop an operation. He was clear that uh, 
he would say to me, because I knew the man very well, and I used to help him on these cases, he would say, you know, the reason that women aren't getting cured for breast cancer is because the surgeon's just not good enough. So he developed an operation where instead of what that mastectomy we're talking about, he actually removed the rib cage. So he would take a saw and he would cut the, the breastbone down here. He would cut the ribs here and everything would be removed. And then on the left side, in the course of this operation where I used to help him back in those days, there was an open space. So on the left side, you could see the heart. And because there was no reconstruction, now let me make sure you understand it. There was no breast reconstruction done because the plastic surgical teams hadn't figured out how to do the reconstruction. So these poor patients had to put a little skin graft over the heart and they had to wear metal plates because if you hit that heart or like in the course of a day, you're playing tennis and a tennis ball hits your chest wall there, you, know, you go into VTAC and you would die. So this was really, a, and guess what? This was the last gasp of radical surgery. This was in the 80s and the patients still developed disease. So we stopped doing this. So that's all, all gone, the picture of how he took everything off. Well, in comes a different way of thinking. And this was about the time in the mid eighties where uh, Bernard Fisher at the University of Pittsburgh started thinking about, well, wait a minute. One of the reasons that Halstead had to do this big radical operation was because there was so much disease because there was no such thing as early diagnosis. Think about it. These tumors would be massively enlarged. They would be already going through the skin. They might even be bleeding. But you know what happened was that because women wouldn't come in early for this because they were terrified about what would happen with their radical techniques. But what happened was as people were living longer and the Halstead mastectomy and the modified mastectomy was making people live longer, people were more apt to come in at an earlier stage and mammography started coming. So we started seeing smaller tumors. So then the idea was, well, maybe we can just take the tumor out, so-called lumpectomy. That was anathema at the time. But most surgeons thought that he was the devil incarnate. How could you just not do what the great Halstead had said you had to do? But Bernard Fisher was very smart. And he said, well, we're going to do a trial. And here's what the trial was. And it's important that you hear about what this meant. So he was telling women who were coming in at the time, there was no early diagnosis. There was no diagnosis ahead of time. You would come in with a lump in your breast. They would put you to sleep under general anesthesia. They would biopsy the tumor at the time while you were sleeping. So if the tumor came back was cancerous, the surgeon would remove your breast. So these women would go to sleep not knowing whether they would wake up with one or two breasts or even no breasts sometimes if it's lumps in both breasts. It's terrifying days. But you, what you did know is that if you had breast cancer and you went to sleep for a general anesthesia procedure with the surgeons at the time, and this is the mid eighties, you absolutely would have your breast removed. There was no issue about any breast conserving surgery. So, Bernard Fisher, he basically said, well, wait a minute, I have an idea. Why don't we do a trial? Doctors always do trials to prove things. This is gonna be a randomized trial. He would basically say, here's the trial. Half of the people will get the lump removed, still to look for lymph nodes, just as they would normally would. But the other half of the trial would be the mastectomy. And so this would be a trial that was blinded. So what would happen is, the surgeon would start the operation, do the biopsy, and if they were participating in a trial, the woman was in the trial, she would sign the paper saying that she's happy to try to do this new technique. The person who was doing the study, the nurse would come in, open up the envelope, and either it said mastectomy or it said lumpectomy. And so if the envelope said lumpectomy, the doctor would just take the lump out, wake up the patient, and she would go home. And then they would have radiation afterwards. So. You might say, could you do a trial like this today? No, but why was it possible to do a trial back then? Because basically it came down to, if you're a woman facing a potential breast cancer therapy, if you went to surgeon A, who did the Halstead mastectomy all the time, and you had cancer, you had a 100% chance that you would lose your breast. If you went to Dr. Fisher and his colleagues, 
you had a 50% chance that you'd lose your breast. And so we did that. Anyway, what happened over time was that in fact, the, the great thing about this was that it really changed the whole idea about treating breast cancer. And so people didn't believe it, but here are the curves. This is what's called a disease-free survival of the curves of people who had a mastectomy or a lumpectomy. And this is over a 20 year period of time and survival without any cancer coming back and the overall survival on these three curves. Guess what? Every single curve is superimposable. There was no benefit whatsoever with the mastectomy or the just taking out the lump. And so in selected patients, this turned everything around. And certainly by the uh, mid eighties to the early nineties, things changed. And it became clear that breast conserving treatment now was appropriate for most of the women with early stage breast cancer. And believe it or not, it was preferable. Now the older surgeons still refused to believe the numbers. They would like five years, well, wait till 10, 10 years, wait till 15. But at this point, it certainly became true that if you could be a candidate for removing that lump and making sure the edges were clean, that this was a preferable way and the survival was, was better. So this changed everything. And so we started talking about, well, wait a minute, not only can we take the lump out, we should start thinking about how the patient looks after you take the lump out, right? Because uh, the other issue was that the plastic surgeons started coming in with ways to do breast reconstruction as well. So people started thinking about the fact that maybe since there is now people living longer and there's what we call life after breast cancer. So you can't say to someone, well, you know what? I'm sorry how you look, but we cured you and go have a happy life. And the sad thing is, if you think about how those women looked after those mastectomies without reconstruction, they never were the same. They were withdrawn from society in many ways. They were ashamed. They didn't want to even talk about it, which is why no one really talked about breast cancer until uh, the mid eighties. And, and when you know people like Nancy Reagan came out and, and talked about her, her disease and how she was treated and, and uh, Gerald Ford's uh, wife also. So people start happy Rockefeller. All these people started talking about the fact that, you know what, we can live through this, but maybe there are ways to make the life better. And so you can look at yourself in the mirror instead of being uh, shocked. So there were techniques that were developed by the surgeons where to put the incisions. And here's an example of how we talk about cosmetic placement. So the idea is that you can use the areolar border. And so if you have a lump here in the breast here on the right side, and you want to take the lump out, sure, you could make an incision here, but you could also make the incision around that pigmented border and hide it. So now this woman has an incision here and you know you can't even tell. And there were techniques to put the breast back together again. So there shouldn't be any indentation or scarring. And here that she's raised her arm up. And again, you can see that the breasts look the same. Everything is, is looks great. Uh, this was an early patient of mine. She was in her, uh, late 20s, early 30s, and she developed breast cancer on the right breast. And here she is having had her lumpectomy already. And oftentimes they would do radiation. So you can see a little bit of the redness. This is early after the radiation to the breast because it became clear that you needed to have some radiation to kind of sterilize the breast because you still had breast tissue at risk. So this is a patient who did not have to have a mastectomy. She had a lumpectomy. And I will show you in a moment that if you raise her arm and the incision was hidden in this inframammary fold here. And she also had lymph nodes removed. Remember, we also talked about removing lymph nodes. And here was her incision for the lymph nodes. And you can see she has full range of motion. The breasts are symmetric. And this redness, this was an early picture, finally disappeared. So there was this push about trying to talk about maybe there's ways to make your operation uh, better maybe the surgical techniques would be improved. And here at Wild Cornell, but other places around the country, people started talking about putting in plastic surgical techniques as part of the breast cancer techniques, right? So to joining the oncology, the onco of the cancer treatment to the plastic work. We, we set up a, a program like this here at Wild Cornell, but other places had similar areas. And, you know, what we basically said to people was it was a new program and it was a, we called it Bright Path. The idea was to cure, but not only to survive 
but the added goal was to thrive. And that was the combination of using the specialist of the cancer surgeon and the plastic reconstructive surgeon working together to, to make the final result, not only that you're cured, but again, that you, as if nothing ever happened, okay? Now, unfortunately, there were some people who did these lumpectomies and they didn't quite know those techniques. So here is a lumpectomy by a surgeon who uh, unfortunately left the incision here, thinking well to go around the areola, but left this defect. So there was an indent here. And here was another surgeon who also tried to do a lumpectomy, but look what happened. They, they put the patient together. This is a patient who came to see me a number of years ago and uh, she was told uh, that she was cured by her surgeon. And, and, uh, and so she came back to the surgeon afterwards and said, well, uh, look at how I look. And what you can't see from this picture here is that in fact, this incision is plastered down to her chest wall and the nipple is basically pointing towards her, her uh, mid sternum here, breastbone. And she said, well, you know, I, what's happened here? I don't, I, I don't look right. And the surgeon said to this young lady, listen, it's just the breast, get over it. I cured you, go ahead and have a happy life. Well, you know what? That didn't work for me and others in working in this program. And we said, well, we're gonna fix this. And so that's what we did. We were able to, it took a little work, but we were able to give her a better contour, fill in the defect. And she was much happier with this as a result. So the smooth guard to place the incisions properly minimize the uh, hit to the breast itself. If you have to do a mastectomy, maybe instead of making that big incision that Halstead made, maybe let's try sparing the skin. The more skin you could save, the better you, you have. So this is where skin sparing mastectomy started about 1991. And it was based on the idea that, you know, this is not a disease of the skin, right? Now this is a lady that had a lot of tissue that was involved and she needed a mastectomy. And so on this right side, the idea was, okay, so how about if we make an incision around where the nipple areola complex is to remove the nipple areola and all the breast tissue, then we would put a little skin graft here. And then afterwards they could tattoo the skin and then create a nipple for her, right? So this was incredibly a big advancement, again, with the plastic techniques that were starting to get improvement there. And this was a, a nice way of doing this. You could save a lot of the skin. The skin color was great. You could have uh, preservation of the fold of the breast hangs down with and the normalization of the shape. So this is the first sparing mastectomy done here in New York City. This is on this side, this is what we did. We ended up uh, a little bit of incision here, a circular incision where the nipple areola complex was. And this patient uh, then had a little skin graft placed here. This is before we did the tattooing and the nipple reconstruction. But you can see that the shape is there that all, it's just important you understand, all the breast tissue has been removed here through that tiny incision. Most people said that wasn't possible, but in fact, it was possible. And we did that. And then you can do a sewing to reconstruct that area of the breast. And then <clears throat> this is what essentially a skin sparing mastectomy with the, the nipple being reconstructed looked like. A, a tiny incision, the implant based reconstruction because we used implants on this particular patient. Uh, looks really well. This was a bilateral mastectomy for her. And she was quite happy and pleased with what as was the result. And you have to say that this is a long way from what we were talking about before. The implants have also come a long way. They, they're now becoming very safe. There was this issue about uh, the implants being dangerous and that has basically been taken away. But in case you wanted to see what this is, this is what the implant looks like. And essentially the implant is placed underneath the muscle as part of the breast reconstruction. The surgeon would have taken all the uh, breast tissue away, okay, all here. And then they would expand this uh, implant as a temporizer to expand the muscle so that you reach the size that you want. And then the second operation would be to remove this temporary implant, which expands and then put in the permanent implant. And that's how it looked like after you're finished. So this is a patient who had the, uh, that procedure done on the right breast. And then she ended up having an implant to basically symmetrize her situation. So this was a mastectomy side. This is a non-mastectomy side. And I defy you to say that you could tell much of a difference and she was quite pleased. And this again, we're going, going into the mid nineties now in the 
two thousand era, era of two thousands, and people are getting better at these reconstructive techniques. Now, another technique out there is if if you didn't use an implant, you also use what was called a tummy tuck procedure, where all the breast tissue would be removed uh, as necessary. And again, these are patients who are not candidates for breast conservative surgery. They had to have lumpectomies. And so the plastic surgical team would come in, the surgeon would remove the breast tissue, save the skin, remember skin sparing is doing, and then take the fat from the abdominal area and use it to be placed in place of where the breast tissue used to be. And this is what this patient looked like afterwards. Now she had bilateral mastectomies. Here's the incision down here in the low pelvic area. Uh, she had all the fat from her abdomen removed. So she had like a tummy tuck. This is basically what this is. But rather than discarding the tissue that was used in the fat and the muscle plane, this has been put into the breast area. And again, you can see how much very natural this is. These are not implant based. These are just your own tissue. And for the right person, that's the best way. And you can see a, a lateral picture of what she looks like here. Again, here's the incision for it. All the skin has been saved in the burial or complex here. Okay. And then again, another picture of showing how this looks like. But here was a, a picture where we started saving the pigmented skin. So things are getting better. So the evolution of the history here is what we said, it's from the 1890s, the radical mastectomy down to the present time, which is the latest thing that's happening and it's called nipple sparing mastectomy. And this has been the last final frontier. And it very much was uh, uh, objected to by some people because they thought, well, wait a minute, you know, if you're taking all the breast tissue out, you're leaving behind the nipple and the breast tissue underneath the nipple. How does that make any kind of sense? If you really want to eradicate disease, you might get cancer in the nipple. And that was the holdover until people suddenly realized that breast cancer almost never starts in a nipple. It can get there from a tumor deeper in the breast, but the nipple itself was not really, I, and by the way, I in all my years have never seen breast cancer start there. So once we figured out that maybe that's safe to do and nipple saving procedure is much better than any kind of nipple reconstruction that you could do using other skin, we started talking about that. And so we started using these same kind of skin sparing incisions that we talked about before. It's kind of like a tennis racket, but this time around, we would just make the incision halfway around. And then this is the nipple would be preserved. And this is another case where we would just go halfway around because here now the nipple and the pigmented skin are surviving based on the skin things. But here's the problem. Think about this. You've now cut off half of the blood supply to that nipple and the pigmented skin. So what unfortunately would happen with this kind of incision is this. This is the last thing that you wanted to happen, but that's because the blood supply was compromised. Now, again, mastectomy, all the breast tissue removed, implant in place, but because the nipple needs blood supply and all this blood supply was half of it was cut off, we thought, oh, this is not so good. This didn't happen all the time, but it could happen. So a bunch of us here at Cornell and other places around the world said, well, wait a minute, maybe there's a better way to do this. So what we came up with was the idea of making the incision not around the nipple or the areolar skin, but putting the incision in what we call the inframary crease. And what's clever about this is that there are two things that work here. One, all the nerves that go into the nipple and to the skin around the breast uh, come from outside laterally, correct? All right. When you make an incision crossing over here, you're going to cut all those nerves that are going to the nipple areolar complex. And if you're cutting half of the blood supply around that nipple areolar complex, that's why you can lose that nipple and then it has to be reconstructed. But guess what? By putting the incision here, then you save all the blood supply around the nipple areolar complex, plus, plus, very important, the nerves also get uh, intact. So you have nerve, uh, because a lot of the patients who had the, the cut across here, the nerves would be uh, denervated and they would feel nothing. All right, so with this idea, this is a, <laughs> we started doing this and we make these incisions. And here's, here's a patient, early on after her surgery. And this was a bilateral mastectomy, okay? Bilateral mastectomy, the incisions are in from memory fold. And here's what they look like afterwards. So let, let me point out once again, 
this is a patient who has had all her breast tissue removed, right? She's had bilateral mastectomies. She's had implant placement and the incisions are in the inframammary fold bilaterally over here. Here's another picture, this is what she looks like. And I can tell you that the goal of removing the breast tissue worked because that's what we're trying to do. But you can see how different this mastectomy is from what we talked about. So this is called a nipple sparing mastectomy. And this is what happens uh, in most places around the country. People are still using that incision uh, around the nipple areola complex. And this is the incision that people who are using the inframammary approach are coming with. So you can see that there's a huge difference in terms of contour and being able to feel normal. This woman feels completely normal. This woman doesn't have sensation here as well as this one does because of the cut. So I just want to end by showing you the difference of where we've come. We've come a long way. This was the Halstead radical mastectomy from even when I was in my uh, younger days at Sloan Kettering. This is the kind of operation we used to do. And this is the kind of operation we're leaving patients with today. So with that, I'd like to say thank you very much for uh, listening to my, give you a really quick rundown for the evolution of breast cancer surgery through the ages. Thank you. Alex, thank you very, very much for an absolutely wonderful presentation. And not only was fascinating and very educational, but it also showed how the woman had to suffer through all these ages in order to be able to come to this point. Uh, it is also wonderful with your suggestion that eventually maybe we'll be able to find a pill for it, like we're finding pills for other problems. So uh, with that, I am going to all turn over to Susie for the questions. Thank you, Dr. Durback. Um, so first question is, what motivated you to pursue this profession? Oh, boy. <laughs> well, I think I always, when I was in training, you know, it's interesting when you, you start training in surgery, uh, it's, it's kind of a potpourri of different kinds of specialties that you learn about the vascular surgery, colorectal surgery, all the different organs that are involved, thyroid work. And, and then you start making a decision about how you want to focus your, your attention. And, you, you know, maybe years ago, you could be what's called an omnisurgeon and you could do all these little things. But frankly, the field was getting more complex. And I wanted always to do something in cancer. So that was my motivation. So when I started thinking about cancer work, I started thinking about, okay, what is the cancer that uh, interests me most? And, and I was seeing, seeing the kind of things that I said when, when I was being trained at Sloan Kettering, that we had wonderful surgeons, a number of them that I've talked about already, who were my teachers. And as great surgeons as they were and continue to be there, I think there was uh, another aspect of this because as a junior person, I would see these women after the surgery and I would see how sad they were. I mean, yes, happy that they, that they had their surgery, they were cured. But then I saw that uh, they just weren't, weren't feeling well about themselves. And, and I started thinking to myself, well, this is an interesting field. There's a lot going on. It also meant that I would be involved with the radiation aspects and the medical oncology. So it's a multidisciplinary approach to this care. And then I started thinking, well, I'm going to watch what plastic surgeons do. Because plastic surgeons have been that they started developing their ideas about reduction surgery and mastopexies and lifts and things like that. So I started watching their techniques. And again, I'm not the only one doing this, but it excited me because I started thinking, well, maybe if I could impact on the lives because people were living longer, I thought this was a field that would, would give me a lot of uh, satisfaction to be able to not only cure these people, but also make their lives better. So that's kind of my long answer to that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, what were the greatest challenges you faced throughout your career and which operations did you find to be most difficult? So in the breast cancer field, um, so the way I would answer this question is, I think that uh, you have to have 
well, surgeons are, are tend to be a very conservative group. And the reason they're conservative is the way you get trained to do something and it works for you, you're going to use that technique. And it takes a long time to change. So look at this Halstead mastectomy. That mastectomy, even the modification, took years and years before people start, started changing the ideas about what they came from. So I think in terms of my approach, you, you either have to be what they call a, an innovator type and a thinking person about asking questions. All right, why are we always doing the same thing? Is, is there some better way to, to do this? And I think for me, every step of the way, you know, when I, when I started talking about saving the skin, people would say, well, actually going even further than that, the fellow that, that did that modification on that Halstead radical, they almost ran him out of town. He says, how can you not take the muscle away? And he said, well, the muscle looks normal. Why do I have to cut a normal piece of structure? And so, and gradually over time. So there's what they call the first people who are, who are the innovators who try something new. And then there are the people that are the late responders. The late responders are the ones who take a while to, to say, okay, maybe this is a better way to do things. And I like to think that in my field, uh, for instance, uh, the skin sparing mastectomy, when we first started doing that, they wanted to run me out of town. They said, there's no way that you're gonna take all that breast tissue with that tiny incision. Well, there was a way and you could prove it. And when we talked about doing nipple sparing and I wasn't the only one doing this, but there were a few people who said, listen, the nipple is safe to save. It doesn't start with cancer. And again, you get slammed by people who don't, don't. So rather than try to learn something new, a lot of surgeons will say, you know, it's extra effort to do this. Well, that's too bad. You've got to do that extra effort for the benefit of your patients. And I think that that's, that's the thing that has kept me going. I will tell you, by the way, at this point, I think I've done just about everything in terms of the surgical. I mean, just those pictures of those patients of mine, they're now with the nipple spare mastectomies. They're quite happy. And this is now almost over 10, 15 years that they've been doing well. I think the last frontier is that I'm working with someone now to try to develop a way to save some of the nerves that go into the central portion of the nipple. That, that's gonna be the last frontier. But the final frontier is going to be not me, not what I'm doing, not because removing breasts is just a terrible thing, I think, as well. I mean, I've tried to lessen that hit to women, but the real answer is what I said before. We're starting to see the medical oncology field coming up with targeted therapies where these tumors are melting away without surgery. That's incredible. Thank you. Um, what advice do you have for us to monitor and catch breast cancer early on? Like, is there because there's such a problem among people who already have diseases such as cancer and they they're not going to the doctor so they don't really know about it so what do you think we can do to make sure people are um getting involved in the process a lot earlier well i think knowledge is very important i think having having uh ways to get to the public to to hear about the fact that uh, you shouldn't be afraid of this breast cancer, because if you catch it early, you're going to live well and long and healthy and won't have to have radical treatments. Uh, I think the fact is that uh, mammography, that, that curve that showed that the death rate was going down, that's directly related to the fact that mammograms are being more utilized. And if, if there's ways to get the public involved in uh, getting screening programs, it's also something called risk stratification. And what that means is that you, you can actually assess, if you have a family history of breast cancer, you know that there's going to be uh, probably a little higher risk for yourself. So there are things you can do to make sure. Make sure you get good breast exams. Go to your doctor, go to the OBGYN. A lot of women see their gynecologist on a regular basis and the breast exam becomes very important. And during those exams, sometimes the patients should ask, okay, how, how risky is it for me? And am I someone who I should be getting exams once a year? Should I get early mammography? Is there other kind of imaging to do? Because I think that finding these tumors at an early stage is very curable, it makes a difference. And so I think that asking your doctor for help. And also there are websites that you can go on to on the internet that will be very helpful. American Cancer Society has a, has a wonderful website, the NCI, 
here in the United States has a great website that, that answers some of those questions for yourself. And you can actually take a little quiz there and just fill in the blanks. And you can actually get a number that tells you how what your risks are and what you should be doing. At what age do you recommend that we start checking and how frequently throughout the year? Generally speaking, I think that uh, that's a two-part answer. If, so I'm going to split it into two kinds of things. If you have a high risk based on family history or had a genetic test that showed that you're a high risk for developing breast cancer, that's a different discussion. And those patients with known risk factors based on genetic mutations that we know about, and we know a lot about that, and they're easy to test with just a simple blood test or even a saliva test. If you find that, then for instance, we often will use breast MRI for screening these younger women because those breast cancers often arise in the 30, 35, 40, 45 year old group. And mammograms don't work very well for those people because the breast tissue is dense, but MRI does. And so that's one group there that would start screening process probably by the age of 30, if not a little bit before. Now, if you're the normal population with no antecedent risk, okay, you generally should start with uh, a good breast exam with your gynecologist starting age 25 to 30 you know, on an early basis. Nice to do that. You can do sonograms that are very easy to be done, especially with a dense breast tissue. And probably by the age of 40, mammography is a good idea. But I think things will change. I think what's going to happen is that the new mammograms that are coming out are faster. They're not as much compression. And, and they're better at visualizing things. So again, starting mammography screening at age 40, but also if someone in your family had breast cancer, let's say it's age 45, you go 10 years prior to that age. So if, if mom had breast cancer at 45, but was tested, found to be negative for a gene mutation, then if you're 35, you certainly should have a mammogram at, at that age. Okay, so it sounds like there are alternative ways to detect breast cancer other than the mammogram um, because that procedure or test can be rather painful for women. So it sounds like they're trying to, are they trying to improve it? And which out of the different ways of detecting breast cancer do you think is most effective as an I, alternative? Yeah, I think the best way is the MRI, breast MRI. However, <laughs> it's, you can't just screen with breast MRI. It's just too much of a complicated process at the moment. But I can guarantee you that what's happening is, and, that, and the reason that the MRI is important is if you really look across the board on mammograms, mammograms will find maybe 80% of all breast cancers. It's 20% miss rate, uh, depending on, on the technique. Uh, if you add sonogram to it, you can boost it up to maybe another 5 to 10%, so maybe 90% of breast cancers identified using both mammogram and ultrasound. MRI will, will find 95 to 98% immediately with one shot at any uh, suspicious area for breast cancer. So clearly that's the gold standard. Now, we just can't do that for every way it is set up now. So I can tell you that my colleagues in the radiation uh, oncology field and also in the radiology world are working on making the MRI faster. Uh, remember, there's no compression with the MRI, so there's no squeezing and, uh, and better imaging. And so, and then probably larger units, so you, know, you don't have a claustrophobia associated with being in that tube. So that's coming down the road, probably within the next uh, two to three years, we'll see that. And I think at that point, it'll, it'll switch over because clearly you're going to pick up more disease at an earlier stage. Got it. Thank you. That's helpful. And so it sounds like getting an MRI paired with an ultrasound um, could get you close to getting similar results. Yeah, probably right. What advice do you have uh, for us in terms of preventing breast cancer? Are there certain lifestyle choices that people can do to help prevent? Um, and is it even possible to avoid breast cancer? Tough question. Uh, people ask me that all the time. You know, ask all of us about this. Uh, I think that it's a rather trite, trite thing to say that I would say to you, well, we should have a good healthy diet. We should exercise, uh, try to have a healthy lifestyle, don't smoke cigarettes. You know, these are kind of things that we all know about. 
and and I think are are probably all related. The sad thing is that there really isn't any particular thing that I can say that if you do this, you'll never get breast cancer. All I can say is that if you do those things, you probably lessen your risks of getting any kind of disease and you're gonna have, uh, have a healthier life anyway. So that I'm a good advocate for that. And you know, there's been studies that show that decreasing uh, like obesity, you know, decreasing weight, uh, fat weight in particular um, is, is helpful exercise is helpful all, the, all these all these intrinsic things that we know about not always we can attain those things but those are the things i think also remember that when we talk about genetically determined breast cancers and we hear about the patients who have the BRCA mutation for instance and some of the other mutations and we think oh well you know family history and i don't have that mutation i won't get breast cancer well remember first of all that genetically determined breast cancer represents only maybe i don't know 15 at the best, 20% of all breast cancers, that 75 to 80% of all breast cancers is what's called sporadic. It means we don't have a good reason for why it happens. There's no good reason. It's just so, uh, but again, a healthy lifestyle for want of a better view. That makes sense. Um, do you, Have you seen any studies on whether like in certain areas of the world, like if they can improve water quality or access to certain resources, can that potentially reduce the prevalence of cancer in those regions? How, have you seen anything on this? Okay, so uh, it, there's no question that there are regional variations in breast cancer incidence. This has been written up, a very interesting thing. In that world picture I showed you, uh, I don't know if everybody could see over to the or right side of the map where Japan. So breast cancer is almost unheard of in Japan. It's, it's very rare, it's very unusual. They have other can cancers that, that come in, stomach cancers and things like that. Breast cancer, almost not seen at all. Yet we know that Japanese who emigrate to let's say the United States and take up the American diet, if you will, get breast cancer at exactly the same rate as, uh, as other people in the United States get. So clearly there's some aspect about, uh, not necessarily environment, although it could be that, but maybe it's the diet that, that is mitigating in this kind of setting. In terms of actually uh, water issues or access to water or, or sanitation, you know, I think that that probably impacts on other kinds of tumors. I'm not sure it's necessarily 100% for breast, but I think in general, it's a good thing to try to, to mitigate against these kind of things you've just brought up. That's really fascinating. Thank you. Um, how long does a patient typically, um, like how long will it take before a patient goes to see the doctor the first time and then goes into surgery? Like, do you know like what the relative turnaround time is there? Well, okay. So are we talking about a breast cancer patient? Because if yeah. it's a breast cancer patient, we, we like to try to get things done as soon as possible. Although we understand that when that person comes in with a tumor or a lump in the breast, uh, that tumor has had a history, right? And so it's not like one day you wake up and you have breast cancer, it may seem like that. And then of course we, uh, so there's there's two things. It's what, what, what I call the physiologic emergency and the psychological emergency. So from a physiologic standpoint, a tumor probably sadly has been there for at least six months to a year, year and a half before it's been identified in some capacity. So I can't, as a scientist, say, oh my God, we have to take this out tomorrow because it will do some bad things to you. That's just not how breast cancer works. On the other hand, there's a psychological emergency involved because once a woman is identified with a cancer in her breast, I know for a fact they they're they're looking at me. They're like, okay, you know, when when can I have my surgery? When can I get this out? And I think it's a process. I think that you have to have a proper workup, and you have time to get that workup. You have time to to see other specialists, perhaps, to get an idea about you know, if we got to talk about reconstruction. Are we talking about maybe a tumor that needs to have treatment before surgery, you know, those, those things. But I think certainly you'd like to have an answer of a plan. I always tell people, if you have a plan in place, the faster you get a plan in place, the best that psychological emergency is like, okay, I've got it, I've got it going. I know it's happening now and I know I have an endpoint. 
And that's the important point of telling people that there is that point. So the faster you can get that. So I, you know, I, I often will tell people that we'd like to get this wrapped up with some sort of uh, plan within, let's say, two to three weeks of being seen. Is it possible to perform breast cancer surgery or breast surgery on women um, who are lactating or have just recently given birth? Well, okay. It's possible to do many things. Is it, uh, is it something that we like to do? No, because I think the problem with operating on uh, lactating breast tissue is that sadly, if you make a incision into the breast, all the milk is going to flow right out to that incision. It's just a, that's a tough way of doing things. I think if you, and it's the other thing is it's hard to, do, to make a diagnosis of a breast cancer in a lactating breast because it's very much engorged. So you're not going to, the mammograms don't work very well. Maybe a sonogram, sometimes bouncing sound waves will pick up or mass or a while, but uh, it's, uh, it's very difficult. So normally speaking, we try not to operate on a lactation. If we have to, we have to. That's that, and it's not for cancer. Sometimes, more often, the lactational breast can have what's called an infection of the breast itself, or mastitis, and that that you just have to treat uh, as soon as you got it. Which out of the surgical options that you went through are the least painful and/or most effective, if they're one and the same or different? Well, if you're going to say the well, there are two broad categories. First of all, basically there's either a breast conserving operation, which is the lumpectomy, or there's mastectomy. And e each one has got a certain reasons for why it is a choice, right? So with smaller disease that's being identified with the new techniques, we're more apt to do breast conserving surgery because we can take a small lump out and still save the breast and have adequate negative margins. You have to get the margins. In other words, when you take that lump out, you have to make sure the edges are all clear because you don't want to leave disease tissue behind. But unfortunately, there are also situations where patients come in and there's more disease than, than expected. And then if it really takes up a substantial portion of the breast, then that option of breast conserving surgery is off the table and you have to then deal with mastectomy. So that's, so it's a call based on doing a proper workup, doing the imaging to see how much disease we have, and also the expectations of the patient. I have patients who sometimes say to me, yes, I know I have a tiny tumor. Yes, I know I could have my the lumpectomy, but remember it's followed with radiation therapy. Some patients don't want to do the radiation therapy. And a lot of them, when they see what happens with those patients that have the newer forms of nipple sparing mastectomy, they say to themselves, well, wait a minute, you're telling me that I can look normal and I don't ever have to have another mammogram or a sonogram or anything else. And I don't have to worry about edges and radiation therapy. I think that if I had pictures to show of those earlier mastectomies, that would be something that would be the last thing on the mind of the patients. But a lot of the younger patients nowadays are saying, well, you know what? Maybe this is for quality of life for me is better rather than to worry about, okay, they biopsy me and then every six months they'll biopsy me again. It's, it's a very personal decision. But from a quality of survival means, okay, because there's survival is number one. If a patient needs a mastectomy for survival purposes, that's, there, there's no option there. That, that's what's given. That makes sense. Thank you. Uh, a two-part question. Does breast size affect disease risk? And the second part to that is today, many girls and women increase the size of their chest or sometimes decrease it through plastic surgery. So can such plastic operations affect the development of the disease as well? Uh, well, the, the quick answer is no, not at all. There's no increased risk of, of uh, breast cancer risk in people who've had augmentation with implants or actually reduction surgery there used to be a concern that the imaging would be more difficult because the implant might hide the tumor that was growing in the tissue that was left behind or that the scarring from doing a reduction surgery might hinder the ability. But with the newer techniques, with the sonograms and the very uh, 
of modern lithography techniques. That that's not the case. We're able to see all of the breast tissue now. There are ways to do that. So I would say that there's really no particular or downside uh, if the patient wants to pursue that. I think that if um, you know, there's an interesting concept that there was a there was one study that came out of the Scandinavian countries where they had matched set of twins. They picked out the twins and one half of the group had reduction surgery, all right? They were large breasts of women. They needed to have a reduction. The other half didn't. And there seemed to be a suggestion that the people who had reduction surgery had less chance of getting breast cancer. So the only way I can understand this actually is that what you've done is you basically reduced the volume of breast tissue that potentially is at risk. But I wouldn't use that as a way to risk reduction for uh, breast cancer. That wouldn't be the reason. The reason to do a reduction surgery is if you have real health, health problems related to the weight of the breast and, and wear and tear on the spine. So those are real issues for women sometimes. Thank you. And last question, appreciate your time knowing we're 10 minutes over, but um, in your opinion, is the population sufficiently informed about breast cancer, the disease itself, and prevention methods? And how do you think it's possible to provide quality knowledge and increase information sharing on this topic? You know, I think that uh, these days with social media, I think that Although I think that's a great way of getting information, I, I sometimes worry about the accuracy of the information that's available because uh, a lot of people will say misinformation out there sometimes or will, will say the wrong things. Or, or sometimes people will hear, you know, people who are happy and pleased with what has happened to them and they're doing well, you're less likely to see those people in these kind of situations. The people that you see sometimes on these uh, focus groups or discussion points are patients who have had bad results. And, and then as a, as a lay person looking into this, I worry that they'll hear about the bad results. You never hear about the good results. You hear about these terrible things that happen and that will hinder people from going in. So I think that the way to get the right information is to go to established medical centers that are known for breast cancer expertise. And again, so I said, you know, on the internet, things, the issues from American Cancer Society, there's the, the National Cancer Institute, the NCI, those are kind of better ways to obtain information. Also, go to your doctor and listen to what the doctor says. Well, thank you very, very much, Alex. That was just a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And your uh, comments about misinformation and how important it is to get the correct and valid and scientifically dedicated and information is just very, very important, especially now that the, in the internet, we have so many so much information on everything. So uh, I'm very pleased that you were able to take the time and talk to our audience, which I'm sure is very appreciative. And I wish you a very, very good and healthy continuation of your work so that you can continue help as many patients as you possibly can. Thank you. And Susie, thank you for your hosting and um, have a very good week. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.